Well, thanks, Alan. I uh, appreciate it, and good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here, and for anybody on Zoom, thanks for being here as well. Um, so the most important word in that introduction is amateur. Uh, I've just kind of learned by doing, I've, I'm a generalist by nature, and, uh, and I'm um, kind of a lifelong kind of learner. I'm naturally curious. Um, so, so, that's, so this is just kind of what I've learned. So don't run home and say, well, John Tyrrell said da 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 and that's absolutely fact. It's, it's, it's truth with a small t. It's truth to me, not necessarily truth with a big t. Um, but over the years, I've, I've learned a lot. And I'd like to share what I've learned, and I'm always looking to expand my knowledge base. So I hope that we can all today learn from each other. Um, so in this class, we'll be exploring uh, questions uh, in hope that the, the answers and the actions that we come, come through will better align our lives with God's call. We're not striving for perfection. Um, our thinking will likely evolve. Um, these are kind of hard subjects, particularly for modern human beings, on how to best align you know, the natural world with our constructed, this you know, world we've created, particularly in urban life. Um, so quick overview of the class. So uh, there will be six classes. We're obviously exploring the connections between uh, food, farms, and faith. Uh, this class will be a, a conversation from a consumer's perspective. Uh, class two will be taught by Dan Latham, who is sitting right there. Uh, Dan is uh, a nationally recognized chef and restaurant consultant. He's also a member, uh, he and his uh, wife Meredith and their two children of First Presbyterian Church here in Atlanta. Um, and then uh, classes two, uh, three and four will be taught by Sam Adams, who is a theologian at Union Theological Seminary up in, uh, he's an Old Testament specialist up in um, Richmond, Virginia. He also is uh, Al and Joanna's son. And then the last two classes will be taught by Mark Douglas, uh, a New Testament theologian with Columbia Seminary, who's taught here several times, and many of y'all know Mark. Um, so, uh, you know, you got amateur hour to today, and then you got professionals all the rest of the way through. Uh, so, how did my journey begin? Um, Ellen, with, with this particular food, and, and in 2007, um, if y'all will remember back then, I'm a, I'm a real estate developer, by the way. Uh, we were at the beginnings of the Great Recession, and we uh, we made uh, we're making some cutbacks on our household budget, and we reduced how much. Uh, care, uh, the caregiver time for our um, daughter, Mary Holmes. And so we were looking for things to do uh, with Mary Holmes on, on the weekends. And so Greer had heard about, my wife, uh, about um, th there was going to be a new farmer's market that opened up in Peachtree Road and so at uh, St. Philip's Cathedral. And so we went there and uh, had a great time. We loved the food. The connections to the community, you know, the earth, and what we really appreciated is how the farmers and the vendors really connected with Mary Holmes. They would talk with her, they would acknowledge her, they were, it was just really sweet and special. Um, so that began what is now just a weekly routine. Every Saturday, Mary Holmes and I go to a, we go to Peachy Road in the summer when it's spring and summer and fall when it's open, and then we visit. Freedom or Grant Park or Morningside in the wintertime, uh, and we've made a lot of great friends. And so where has it led? We've got, we've made a lot of deep and long-lasting friendships. Dan is an example. He was uh, consulting with a group uh, in a pizza business, and that's how, at the farmer's market, and that's how I met Dan. And we got to know Meredith, his wife, and, and, and his two children, uh, Guy and Sadie. Um, it's also resulted in lots of cooking experience, experiments with Greer can tell you some turned out okay and some not so much. Uh, I'm, but I've also taken a lot of terrific cooking classes and have learned a lot and learned that even if you're kind of an instinctual kind of experimental cook, uh, you, you still, uh, there's fundamental principles that you can ab abide by and, uh, and, and 
uh, have a better odds of, of a good meal. Um, I really gained a deeper appreciation for food. And I think before then, um, you know, say the blessing and one really think that much about the food itself. And, and now I think about that a lot. Um, and I've become an active participant in the good food, food movement. And, um, you know, with George Organics, uh, also supporting the Center uh, for Agricultural Resilience, which is CIFAR, um, which is at White Oak Pastures and in Bluffton, Georgia. We're gonna watch a couple of videos from there today. So as you probably know, you know, we're, we're in a health crisis here in America, and there's lots of contributing factors. Uh, and, but the, the facts are obesity rate has tripled over the last 50 years from about 12% in 1960 to over 40% today. The rate of the U.S. population with diabetes has gone from less than 2% 50 years ago to over 11% and growing. And then when you start to look at the numbers of what's happening with children in both those categories and other health metrics, it's pretty scary. And we're also seeing our life expectancy decline from its peak in 2019. It dropped significantly in 20 and 21 due, to law, and due in part to COVID. But as Peter Barrett has said many times, COVID's not the only answer. And in fact, Peter talked about that when he first got into practice, uh, it was very rare to have a high risk uh, pregnancy, the, that the mother was high risk. Today, it's, it's, they're, they're more, it's more common, it's, you, he sees more high risk pregnancies than he sees normal pregnancies. Part of that has to do with women having babies later, but the number one reason is obesity. And, and so, you know, if you think about, you know, our bodies are roughly 30 trillion cells and you know, our job is to feed it as much, those cells as much good, clean, pure fuel, food, as we can. It's sort of like you know, pulling your car up to the gas station and filling it up with 27, 10, 27 octane gas and expecting it to run like a, you know, run great. Well, of course, the check engine light's gonna turn, come on pretty quickly and the regenerative farming and, and kind of thinking more intentionally about your food um, is um, will really help help you eat better. The, the other thing that's happened is that we're seeing uh, significant uh, declines in the health of the soil because we've become so dependent upon man-made inputs. And that's showing up in our food. Uh, the University of Texas, um, you know, which is not exactly a way out on the left kind of state, uh, did a study in 2004, and it showed significant, they studied uh, every year, the USDA produces, they do studies and they say, you know, there's, these are the nutrients in corn, or these are the nutrients in green beans, or what, you know, they, they analyze it every year. And so they studied all this analysis, and they saw dramatic decreases in the nutrients that are in the fruits and vegetables we eat now, or ate in 2004, than we ate in 1950. And that all has to do with the depletion of the soil, and that the soil's not as rich. The other thing is if, if most of us, those of us that are meat eaters, myself included, uh, when we eat uh, conventionally raised, factory farmed meat, um, uh, we are eating, which most all of us don't do. I mean, most restaurants, most the bulk of meat sold in groceries is, 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 is farmed through, you know, these factory farms, raised these factory farms, especially meat farms. Um, we're eating very unhealthy animals. Uh, like, for example, a, a cow in that environment will die, will, won't live more than three years. It'll die from heart disease, it'll die from um, 
just obesity, just sheer overweight. The chickens are so big they can't even, because they're, they've been bred to have humongous breasts, um, they can't, in many cases, they can't walk. Um, same thing with the hogs. And so it begs the question, if we're eating these very unhealthy, you know, does that, does, is there a connection between the unhealthy animals that we're eating and humans' own health declines? And if you compare the United States' life expectancy to um, other developed nations, we've gone from being sort of in the middle 50 years ago to the bottom. So it's not happening necessarily everywhere. So that raises more questions. So um, we're going to show two videos, and I'm going to, uh, it's, uh, uh, they're about uh, white oak uh, pastures, and uh, it's starring Will Harris, who's the owner of the farm. I'll, I'll tell you, Will is like a, he's a, kind of this iconic, bigger than life kind of man. He's, he's really uh, contributed a lot to my thinking about food and farming, and I think Dan would probably say the same thing. He is, he's a terrific guy. Uh, Greer first met him, I think it was in 2002 when we first moved to Buckhead, and he was, had, was just converting his farm from the conventional farm to uh, grass fed, and he was, he was walking up and down the aisles of the Publix in, here in Buckhead at, at West Paces, uh, selling uh, grass-fed beef, and Greer came home with two pounds of grass-fed beef from White Oak Pastures, and said, "Met this great guy." And then, fast forward to 2015, we were uh, on his farm for a farm tour as part of a George Organics convention, and Greer told him that story. And he looked, and he has I can't replicate his accent, but he looked at Greer and said, "Well, those were some dark, dark days." And he'll tell you a little bit about that in this video. But he's unusual in that that the risk he took, because he was making a lot of money farming conventionally. Um, but why don't, you, why don't you queue up, and I guess we'll turn the lights down. When I was a full-time commodity cowboy, all I thought about was how many pounds of beef I could squeeze out of this farm at the lowest possible price, with no real focus except pounds of beef and how cheap I can do it. Today, I never ever think about how many pounds we can sell. What I think about all day, every day is, how can I make this land better? What if I put compost this way? What if I put a cover crop that way? What if I graze it in a different way? What can I do to make that happen? We're standing here on my farm in the edge of Bluffton, Georgia. It's one of the poorest counties in the nation. Wonderful land, wonderful climate, and poor people. The census says there are 102 people. We can't count but about 50. The only thing you can buy in Bluffton is a stamp if you get there between 8 and 12 during the week. If you need a gallon of milk or a tube of toothpaste, it's 12 miles to the store. And what happened to Bluffton what happened to so many small rural towns that had a purely agrarian economy. With the centralization of industrial agriculture, it simply wasn't needed anymore. There was no economic reason for this town to be here, so people moved to places where they could get better jobs. From here, I can see a dozen of these old stores in Bluffton. Mr. Greer Mansfield had a store right here, General Merchandise, and Mr. Herman Bass had a store here, about an eight-foot alley between them. And I remember my mother going in and uh, Mr. Herman saying, well, you must have not got what you wanted at Grills. I see you swimming there first. It was very competitive. 
as far as the impoverishment of rural America, nobody of my father's generation said, let's just suck all the money out of this little town and let it dry up and blow away. That never happened. My father told me that in 1946, a salesman invited all the farmers to a fish fry and he brought 200 pound bags of ammonium nitrate fertilizer with him. And his ask was, get out in your pasture, put it down in a pattern, and leave it for three days and come back and look at it. And when my father came back, you know, the grass was this much higher than the other grass. You know what he said? He said, shit, I want my whole farm to look like that. And we put nitrogen fertilizer on every acre of our land every year from 1946 when he was doing it until 1995. What we couldn't see is that that ammonium nitrate fertilizer killed the microbial life that fed the soil. It was an unintended consequence. I went to the University of Georgia and majored in animal husbandry. It became animal science, and it was very industrial cattle farming. And I came back and did that for about 20 years and was good at it. But every year, I liked what I was doing a little bit less. The industrialization of agriculture sought to make this farm a factory. And nobody sane and normal should enjoy watching a cow in a feedlot or a hog in a gestation crate or a chicken in a battery cage. And I came to hear about consumers that wanted grass-fed beef. And it appealed to me. And I started slowly changing my production practices. And the first thing that I did was give up confinement feeding of corn. I gave up uh, sub-therapeutic antibiotics. And I gave up uh, hormone implants. And that was all I ever really intended to do. And then decided that using chemical fertilizers and pesticides on the pastures was as wrong as using hormone implants and subtherapeutic antibiotics. That's my daddy with Will Bell Harris. I was taken at my wedding. The only time a flower of got put on his lapel. <laughs> my daddy talked more like foghorn leghorn than I do. And my father was not involved in me changing this farm from an industrial farm to what it is today. He died of dementia, and uh, I didn't start the process until about 1995, so we didn't have to have that discussion. Uh, he would have been opposed to that, and rightfully so. We made money every year. Never lost money, ever. Come on, up. There were many, many times that I woke up and said, what in the hell was I thinking? Because we went from no debt to borrowing seven and a half million dollars to build processing plants and operating for a number of years in which I literally lost money every year. You know, I didn't know if I was going to lose the farm that my great granddaddy had established 130 years earlier, the farm that I was supposed to leave for my children and put my wife in a position where she could have died in a rented mobile home somewhere. And those were dark days. I'd work till dark. I'd go in, I'd drink a bottle, a bottle and a half of wine. I'd go to sleep. About two o'clock, I'd burn through the wine. I'd get up, go to the bathroom, make coffee, put my boots on and go again. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, we took incredible risk. Today, I'm very glad that I made the changes that I made because the farm is again profitable and cash flow positive, and two of my daughters and their spouses have come back to work on the farm, and at least that last part probably wouldn't have happened under the other scenario. I used to consider what I did to be a very simple business. I had nothing but cattle, dogs and horses to work the cattle, cowboys to work the dogs and horses. We raised the cows, we fed corn to the cows, we sold the live cows. That's pretty simple business. And then I got into an even more simple business. Today, we don't feed animals, we feed the microbes in the soil. 
microbes feed the soil, and the soils feed the plants, and the plants feed the animals, and they breed, and they grow, and we turn them into meat and sell it for money, which is like the blood that pumps through our bodies to keep it all going. And it's really a beautiful system. And what's most beautiful is that every generation, the animals are healthier and healthier, happier and happier. You know, my daughter had really been after me to bring sheep in. I think oh, she thought they were cute, but I brought them in because we desperately needed them. There's a lot of symbiosis, a lot of synergy that comes from having cattle and small ruminants in a polyculture together. The internal parasite that affects cattle most are brown stomach worms. Sheep don't care about brown stomach worms. The internal parasite that affects sheep most are barber pole worms. Cattle don't care about barber pole worms. So if you've got the two species out here together, like these are, it's like a dead end street with the life cycle of the brown stomach worms and the sheep and the barber pole worms and the cattle. I don't know why any serious cattleman in this country wouldn't have some small ruminants out there with them. It's, it's, it's profitable. So this is a pasture that has been grazed off real short, and they got poultry is out there now. They're out here in the pastures in these houses. There's nothing constraining them at all. They could walk from here to Atlanta if they wanted to. Those houses are portable. We move them once a week to give them an area that's free of pathogens and parasites so they stay healthier. Another reason is to move that chicken manure around. If chicken manure is all concentrated in one place, it's toxic. But if it's moved around, then it's, it's feed for the microbes in the soil. Horn flies and face flies, which are pests for cattle, lay eggs in the manure. Chickens scratch in the manure and eat the larva and it's feed for the chickens and it breaks the life cycle of the pest for the cattle. So it's a great example of symbiosis. Prior to about 1995, we had about 700 cows and we sold the calves fairly soon after weaning. Since then, we've increased the carrying capacity dramatically. We've still got about 700 mama cows, and we have about 1,000 goats, about 1,000 ewes, about 100 sows, and then the poultry, chickens, turkeys, geese, guineas, and ducks. There's about 100,000 beating hearts on this farm on any given day. Our pastures are better than they've ever been because we don't till them up, we don't use chemical fertilizer, we don't use pesticide. It's more teeming with life, there's more nutrient density. The organic matter in our pastures has gone from less than a half a percent to over five percent over about 15 years. We had never seen a bald eagle on this farm until about five years ago. Bald eagle, look at it. And today we have 26 that live on the farm. The Department of Natural Resources says this is the largest eagle population in Georgia. It's a sign of the ecological health of this farm. You know, I'm different from most of the people that I know in this sustainable, humane food movement in that I am one of the good old boys that produced food industrially, and then I went commanding. And I still talk to those people, they're still my friends. And one of the things that they say is, well, I mean, what you're doing is fine, Will, but you can't feed the world like that. And my response is, I don't know that I'm supposed to feed the world. I think I'm supposed to feed my community. We have about 120 employees. We're the largest private employer in any of these counties around here. We have bought a number of houses and storefronts and lots in Bluffton. About 10 of these houses 
we've renovated for the purpose of employee lodging. These next three houses belong to me. I've got my livestock manager and farm events manager living in that house. My organic farm manager and his wife live in that house. And my poultry manager and his wife live in that house. So John Muir has told us that in nature, when you pull a string, you see that everything is connected. There's no reason to believe that the health of the soil is not connected to the health of the community. In rebuilding the soil, we are rebuilding a farmer middle class. Just about everything I see makes me feel good. It makes me feel good to see these eagles flying across. It makes me feel good to see the squirrels playing in the trees. And it makes me feel good to see all these animals, both wildlife and farm animals, expressing instinctive behaviors. I think it's healthy for me and my family and my employees and my customers to eat food that's raised like this. It is food as nature intended food to be. You know, the expression is, I get paid for what I was made for. Technically, I work 16 hours a day, because 16 hours a day, I'm on this farm, I'm, if I'm not physically on it, I'm thinking about it, but I don't feel like I work at all. I, I, I would do for free what I do for a living. Is the mic on? Yeah. So the, a couple of things. Uh, that video, I think, was done in maybe 2017. And uh, since then, uh, he had 120 employees then. They have 180 employees now. Uh, when Greer and I went uh, to our first visit to White Oak Pastures, the little town of Bluffton was what you saw. It was basically nothing. Uh, they'd gone and opened a, uh, a general store with a restaurant, uh, serves uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, they've renovated more homes, and it's, it's, it's still very much a rural working class community, but it's, it's a thriving community. And then they've built uh, uh, um, and renovated some homes to where uh, they have places to stay. So if you ever want to visit uh, White Oak Pastures or take one of the, uh, the non-profit he started, uh, CFAR, if you ever want to take a class there, you can do that. Or if anybody's ever interested in uh, putting together a field trip of Trinity members to go down there uh, and take a tour uh, and spend the night and, and, uh, and just see it in, live in person. That's, it's easy to do, they do that all the time. So the second one is on water. So I don't know if anybody in here likes to eat oysters. Um, uh, I did, in fact I, I won in 1983, I won the oyster eating contest for the entire University of Tennessee. <laughs> Uh, I'm now allergic to oysters and I can no longer <laughs> eat oysters, so uh, you can't have too much of a good thing. Uh, but uh, this one's on, on water, which you hear a lot in the media about carbon, but I'm actually more concerned about water. And I think a lot of people that are knowledgeable, they've learned a lot, there's reasons, that's where we could have in our, having some serious world conflict and it's just going to get worse if we don't address it. Go ahead. here. We're looking, it's been a pretty good rainy day here in Bluffton, Georgia, White Oak Pastures. And what we're seeing is there's a uh, pivot of corn across the road here. On one side it's not White Oak Pastures, and then on the other side of the road that is White Oak Pastures. And what I think is important to talk about in this particular site is looking at the water coming out of the healthy uh, system here at White Oak, but we do have some runoff with the amount of heavy rain we've had today, but that water's coming off clear. There's very little sign of, of erosion and soil movement and loss of uh, topsoil, which is super important compared to the conventional corn system that we've got on this side, where all that couple hundred acres of corn ground is eroding away and washing that topsoil off and into this uh, 
along with it is coming whatever uh, chemical fertility has been added to it and topsoil and, and life. So that system over there is definitely degrading today, right in front of us, whereas this system on this side is intact, resilient, holding on to as much water as it can, and what shedding off of it is clean, and then they're ready to drink. So pretty interesting sight here. The water from the left is coming off of about right at 2,000 acres. That's a little over 2,000 acres of land. And it's coming off a little over 200 acres of land. And it just visually, it looks like more water coming off the 200 and something than off the 2,000 and something. Forget the qu quality of the water, just the, 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 the quantity of it. Drinking coffee every day didn't work for me, but I couldn't figure out why until I went from 184. <laughs> Just for the record, drinking coffee every day does work for me. Uh, <laughs> so uh, a couple things to point out there. One is that, uh, you know, if, if us as homeowners or me as a real estate developer allowed that kind of runoff to happen on a construction site, we'd be under arrest. But the, the, way the, 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 the way the farm bills are written and the way the laws are written, that's totally waived for ag. And, um, and when that water's rushing off, it's not only topsoil, it's also all the fertilizer, all the man-made inputs. And that's getting into our water system, which is causing dead zones in the ocean Etc. Uh, but let me take a minute. Does anybody have any thoughts, questions, comments from what you've seen? Yeah. You're, you're probably about to get to it when you talked about the oysters and all that. But uh, on the waterfront and ag in Southwest Georgia, in particular, where that is, you have. You, you have some thoughts about irrigation, and does Will Harris engage in irrigation? He does not. Uh, and the reason they don't, they don't have to, because uh, they're, uh, the, they retains the, the soil, the organic matter. I think he said in the video it's 5%. I think now it's more like closer to 8 But it retains so much water. The ponds retain so much water. I mean, I, I mean, they have wells for the homes, and they have city water too, but, but they don't do massive irrigation, uh, which makes this type of farming riskier. Uh, but, uh, and in some cases, in some regions, they do irrigation, but they don't have to use near as much of it. So if they have to get through a, uh, so irrigation in itself is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it's like eating too many oysters. If you do, if you do it, if you're totally dependent upon it and do too much of it, it will become a bad thing. And that's where we're seeing the depletion in the uh, groundwater and all that, as you're well aware of as an environmental attorney. Alan, do you have something? Yeah, uh, I, I was just wondering what the typical curriculum of a class down uh, at White Oak Pastures is. They offer all kinds of classes from, uh, like Greer and I took a soils class down there, which was a three-day or maybe four-day class and uh, that really gets deep into soil and soil science and is primarily geared to farm for to far farmers uh, we took it because we were just curious about it and we've actually able to, to take some of those principles that we learned and apply it kind of to, to our gardening at home and things like that um, but they also have classes like they have uh, classes on, uh, you know, one day classes on kind of cook, cooking, butchering, uh, just kind of general classes. So they have, they, uh, they offer, they offer both. You can just, if you just Google White Oak Pastures, uh, uh, CFAR, uh, you, can, you can see the classes that they offer and they vary all the time. Um, so how does this relate to faith? Um, I believe that, you know, we, you know, that God, you know, the greater power, you know, created the earth and created the environment that we live in. And that 
as human beings, uh, our job is to, to be good stewards. So like for instance, in the, in the real estate that uh, the company I'm with, we hold the fee simple interest in that most people would say that we own, I don't look at us owning that, those buildings and owning that property. I look at it as we're stewards. Because hopefully if they're, built, if they're built well, those buildings will be around long after I'm gone. And, and that's true of everything. And so when you look particularly what's happened since the industrial age, um, it really begs the questions, you know, can we be better stewards than we've been over the last 100 to 200 years? And I think the answer is yes. At the same time, I don't think we should beat ourselves up and constantly, you know, be, 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 get all down about our past sins. We have to really look, learn from them and, and then look to the future. Um, the other is, is the issue of factory farming and the treatment of animals. Uh, you know, when animals are not allowed to express natural behaviors and then they get their own forms of anxiety and all that kind of stuff. And uh, that, um, that really is that, they're God's creatures too, and that raises other issues. Um, and then I think the, the biggest thing is, you know, the, the soil was, is a gift to all of us, and the rich soil is a gift of all of us, and we've been letting our soils deplete the way that we've depleted. Um, you know, that, that's a big question of, of, you know, should we pay more attention to our souls? Should we be thinking about how we, how we treat the, those souls? And so then you start to ask, well, what can we do? And I think one is just to become better consumers, better formed in consumers. You know, one thing that Will talks about a lot and others in the, in the Good Food Movement talk about a lot is we're not going to change policy through the federal government or, for that matter, state government. You can maybe make a few tweaks on the margin, but the reality of it is there's so much money in politics today that big money will win every time. So if you look at terms like organic, that was what regenerative farmers were originally calling the type of farming they did. Well, big food adopted organic because they could get premium pricing for it and then worked with the USDA to dilute what organic means to where it still is better than conventionally raised. I mean, for example, they've, you, you, you can't use human sewer sludge to fertilize organic food, even industrially. But you can use human waste to fertilize uh, conventionally raised fruits and vegetables in the United States. That's one of the few things they've held, <laughs> managed to hold on to, but, but a lot of it. And so now the formerly organic farmers have now adopted uh, Regenerative is the term, which is an undefined term, in that you're already starting to see regenerative. Uh, you know, Will was the first sell, rancher selling grass-fed beef to sell to Publix and to sell to Whole Foods, and they were a huge part of his business. When Amazon bought Whole Foods, you know, they, they put the, you know, pressure on him, he had to cut his prices, he had to go cheaper, he couldn't, you know, couldn't do that. And, and eventually, I think it was last year, year before last, they parted ways. And that was a huge piece of his business. He's built a great uh, uh, direct-to-consumer business. Um, they have a big shipping operation now, that's part of the additional employees. Uh, last year they did about $30 million in sales, but it's very low margin, so it's not, you know, it's, it's not getting, but just be aware, you know, th words like all natural, product of the USA, you know, uh, cattle or they can be raised anywhere in the world, but if they're butchered here, they're, pro you know, just cut up or packaged here in the United States. They're, they're then a product of the USA. Um, and so, you know, all natural, that really doesn't mean anything. Uh, uh, it's all been watered down by big food. Um, other things we can do in addition to uh, um, 
becoming better for informed consumers is, is shop regularly at local farmers markets. Um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I see Martha and Tom for some of a long time regularly at the Peachtree Road. I think they're shopping at Marietta maybe or someplace a little bit closer to home now. But uh, and the relationships you build, that's why you come. I mean the food's great, but it's it's uh, and uh, I still I mean Paula asks me every time I see you about about the two of y'all. Um, so it's it it really is meaningful. Um, cooking as many meals as you can at home, and got a lot of great friends in the restaurant world, and it's good to support them. Um, but you know the the way you know that you're getting really good food is you know who you're buying the food from, what their culture or ethics you know principles are, and and then you're cooking it yourself. And uh, you know the more you can do that, um, the better you are. And then also supporting restaurants that support um, uh, you know the 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 local food movement. Um, supporting organizations like CFAR, uh, George Organics, Wholesome Wave. Wholesome Wave is a really neat nonprofit. They, uh, what they do is, is part of what they 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 work with with the urban poor, and they double WIC dollars, food stamp dollars. You can bring in twenty dollars of a food stamp dollars, and they'll convert it to forty in a local farmers market. When they first started that, that's like this is really great and cool, but the folks that were, were getting the food, they didn't know what to do with the food because they had lost, because of living in food deserts, they didn't know how to cook. You know, Grandma may have been an awesome cook, but it didn't pass down through the generations because they were, you know, eating out of, out of a quick market or, you know, jack-in-the-box or something. Um, so, um, uh, you know, it's also, there's a big need to help young people get into the farming world. It's, it's, it's a very, you know, it's, it's very capital intensive and it's very low margin. So from a pure capitalist standpoint, it's, it's really getting to farming as a call. And I think through the organizations I mentioned and others, uh, you know, supporting the local farmers and helping them get into the business. I mean, it is for many just a subsistence living, and a lot of them don't make it because they just they can't make enough to, to to take care of their families. But supporting local farmers is a big, big thing. Um, reading, studying, uh, I would highly recommend. Uh, Will wrote a book. Uh, that came out last year called A Bold Return to Giving a Damn that tells this whole story. It's a great book. Uh, and there's plenty of others out there on it. Just being aware of your food choices uh, in the community, being um, a food uh, myth buster, and then also being just realistic on what we can do. I mean, I'm, I think, you know, there's plenty of times that I eat out, you know, have particularly business meetings or something like that. And I know I'm just eating regular conventional food and I don't make a big deal out of it. Um, I think that, you know, being real judgy about it and holier than thou, that, that's, that's never the right answer. So, but being, you know, when people seem to, you know, maybe they're at, they might approach you about a question about health or food, being able, to, being equipped to have those conversations, I think is really helpful. Um, and then, uh, then I like to close with a story. Uh, back in November, uh, which people that know me would never get, and some of y'all in this room would say that John is never the type that would wear bracelets. Well, um, I started wearing these two bracelets back in November, and um, what happened was Mary Helms and I were doing our usual thing, coming to the Peachtree Road Farmers Market. And so uh, one of the farmers there, Big John, he, he, he's, he's a cattleman, he works on leased land. He was a, uh, worked on the Ford assembly line uh, and retired after 30 years and got into farming. He'll be 80 this year, and he's, he's a big guy. He's, uh, but uh, 
So we pull up, and we, I mean, we, you know, with the wheelchair, and walk up, and, and so then John starts saying, you know, how much he appreciates Mary Helms and me coming in every day and every week, and how much he values his friendship. I have uh, um, kind of mentored one of his sons who, who is, was going through some career changes a few years ago, and, and, and we've gotten to be good friends through that. And, uh, and he said, you know, just the love and kindness I see, it just warm, and, and the two of you, it just warms my heart every, every, every day, every time I see y'all. So then we shop a little bit more, and we come up to uh, uh, Heart to Harvest Farm, which is Paul Soar over near Athens, Georgia. And then Paul goes into how much he appreciates everything that we've done for them and, and, tells, and, and uses the word love and kindness and how much he enjoys. And, and, you know, seeing Mary home, she just warms his heart, everything. So I thought, wow, it's kind of sort of, you know, one like a special day or anything. I was like, wonder. So then we go around, and then uh, Michael McMullen, who I've known for 17 years, and and uh, he and his his wife uh, Rebecca, are good friends, and in these folks, if they called and needed anything, I would do everything. Greer and I would do everything we could to 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 do that for them, and and they, you know, uh, have. But all three of these men have been mentors to our son um, as well. And so Michael goes in, and he starts crying and talking about the love. And I'm like going, well, this is really, but there's no way that they could have planned it. So and I thought, well, I need to remember this. And so then I went up to Nelms, who's a metalsmith. And I said, Nelms, I want to get something for like my bookshelf, you know, that just kind of this, and I told him what had happened. I just want to remember this day and remember, you know, just to always be conscious of love and kindness. And Nelms looks me straight in the eyes and says, John, if you're going to remember it, you got to wear it. <laughs> uh, so he, uh, so I bought these two bracelets and I enjoy wearing them. And the other thing, uh, they happened to, I picked aluminum and steel because I was like the, how the colors look together. But that also reminds me of, of being strong like steel, but flexible like aluminum. We're always learning. There's always new information coming out. Yes, there's principles and, and, and that, that we, you know, we want to be grounded, no doubt about that. But, but we don't want to be, we, we want to be open-minded. We want to be thoughtful. And when somebody comes to us from a different place, whether it's about food or politics or business or anything else, you know, we are our best selves and we usually have the best outcomes when we calm our minds and really listen to what they had to say and, if appropriate, give honest feedback back to them. Now, that is hard to do. It's a lifelong project for me. Um, hopefully, I've made a few steps in the right direction over the years. So any other questions, comments, thoughts? Thank you, John, for presenting today. And we hope everyone will come back next week to see Dan Latham. OK. And uh, really appreciate y'all coming. Please, uh, I would really appreciate everybody try to invite at least one or two people to come on, too. Uh, we've got some great speakers.